Uh, like she said, my name is Tim. I'm from GovernNet, and we, uh, we have developed the CurriculumNet system. Uh, has anybody dealt with curriculum, or excuse me, CurriculumNet before, seen it, done anything with it at all? A little bit? Okay. Um, what Bonnie was saying is basically it's a one-stop shopping place for your curriculum development. The CurriculumNet system serves two functions, two purposes. The first purpose is it acts as a repository for all of your courses and programs. So everything that's active now in your college catalogs is actually in the CurriculumNet system. Our data entry team went through and uploaded all the information, so it's all there. Uh, in fact, I, I've logged in right now, and I'll show you the websites, and we'll get into this in just a little bit. <clears throat> I'm going to go and perform a basic course search so we can go and see. Let's see, here we go. Um, I'm just going to go and pull up some, some basic uh, information here. I'm going to, I can go and search by college. I can search by status so I can see if it's active, it's, if it's been approved, or maybe it's in the works right now. At this point, I'm just going to look for active courses, and we're going to go pick on the uh, biology department at, at this time. I'm going to go ahead and execute that search. So at this point, we can see all the course outlines of record that are in the system right now. We have a series of icons right here that we're going to get into later on. The one I want to draw your attention to is this WR, or this Word Report. This is going to let me see the outline for that particular class. So you can see up here, this is a coastline course. We have coastline up in the upper right-hand corner. And then we have our, our outline, which should match what you're, you're used to already. So we have information like the justification, catalog information, and other helpful bits of information that belong on the course outline of record. Now, <clears throat> From time to time, it becomes necessary to go and update your curriculum. I believe every three years you have to go and take a look at your curriculum and make sure that it's up to par and that it's uh, meeting the needs of the students. So that brings in the second, uh, the second purpose of the curriculum system, and that is it provides a vehicle to approve curriculum. So when I go into the system, I'm going to go and create my course or create my program or maybe revise it. And once I'm done with that, I'm going to put it into a certain workflow or approval process. Now before, you'd have to go and fill out a uh, Word document, send emails out, wait for people to respond back to you. They'd tell you, I don't like this or change this or whatever. You, there's a bunch of document sharing going back and forth, lots of emails. So we've taken all of your forms and combined them into one system and also made uh, the approval uh, system very streamlined as well. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a simple little diagram up here. <clears throat> this is going to be representative of the approval process, and I'm just going to pick um, positions at random. But who, uh, who's a member of the curriculum committee? we have any of those in here? Or deans, perhaps? Anybody else? Librarians, articulation officers, those types of things? Okay. So we've got several positions at the college that has to go and approve curriculum before it can actually become an active part of our you know, course offerings. So it starts out with the originator launching it and then perhaps it comes down here to the uh, the division curriculum representative uh, maybe we have a dean over here or a librarian uh, and I'm, again I'm just kind of picking things at random but I think you kind of get the idea there are several people that are going to take a look at the curriculum and approve it well the curriculum or the curriculum system is going to automate this whole entire thing so when I have something and I dump it in as the originator uh, and then it gets pushed to the division curriculum representative and the dean to take a look at. An email notification is going to go out and say, hey, you've got something that you need to approve based off of your position. And then there will be um, <clears throat> uh, seven items that you'll follow to uh, instructions so that you'll go into the system, you'll know exactly where to click on and what to do to actually review and then approve the <laughs> curriculum. So the idea is to go through this whole entire process with all the approving positions until it gets to the very end where it's finally approved and a part of the official curriculum at your uh, local campus. Okay? So whenever I refer to the approval process, I'm talking about this little diagram right here. Uh, I also refer to it as the workflow or the proposal type. Okay? So it has a couple of different names. And uh, when we get into the system, we'll actually see some of these in action here. Okay? <coughs> Now, when you're going through and you're approving the curriculum, the nice thing about the curriculum system is uh, everything is real time. So if I go in and if I make a change to uh, a course outline or a course, it's going to immediately replicate on all the reports. It's also going to replicate throughout the system. 
So and every time I pull up a report, I'm always going to have the most current and up-to-date information. Uh, another thing that I can do is when I'm approving curriculum, I want to see what types of ramifications it has uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the college. Here is an example of a proposal impact report that you will have access to when you are reviewing and approving curriculum. So this one right here, <clears throat> we've got History 7, Indians of North America. This is actually a course I pulled up from another school uh, since right now uh, there isn't any revision going on with, the, uh, with Coastline because um, it's a new system. But in any case, uh, this shows me right here that uh, this course, History 7, has a cross-listed course right here. So if I make changes right here, it's going to impact this cross-listed course. Or maybe this course is, uh, has a prerequisite or a co-requisite. So if I make changes, I don't want to inadvertently mess something else up. Another example of this uh, down here for programs, let's say that this course is part of a program sequence. So if I offer a course that's four credit hours in length, and I go and I do my update, and for some reason I change it from four credit hours to three credit hours, uh, my associate's degree drops from 60 credits to 59. Now we have a problem, right? So I want to make sure that if I make a change here, it's not going to mess anything else up. And so this is one tool that we have to help you see that. Another tool that we have is the, uh, the course changes report. And this one is really, really nice because when you go to do a, a course update, a modification, and you're looking at that course and you're approving that, you want to make sure that you know, the right things are being updated and that you agree to them. So what this is going to do is it's going to give us the course outline, and it's going to give us um, the... Uh, old information highlighted in red with a strike through and new information that's replaced it is going to appear in green. So at a really quick glance, if I want to see what's changed between the versions of the course, because I'm not quite sure about it, I can come right here and look at this, uh, this report right here and see exactly what changes are being made. Okay? So again, this is another report that we'll get to in just a little bit. I wanted to, to go and uh, <clears throat> show you some of the, the features that we have here uh, with the Curricunet system. Okay, so once again, the main reason, or the main purpose of Curricunet, it acts as a repository. It's going to house all of your current information. The second thing is it provides an approval process to update current information, and we also have a bunch of reports that are available to you to assist you in your responsibilities. Okay, so let me jump back over here to the main site. To log into the live site, you're going to use your employee ID or excuse me, your banner ID and then your employee ID is going to be uh, your password. Okay? So this will be a regular faculty's view when you log in. And it, again, it is case sensitive. I'm logged in as an administrator. My screen is going to look a little bit differently than yours. I'll go ahead and point out the differences when they appear. For now, I'm going to go over the general navigation of the site. Right over here, uh, I've got this admin section. You won't have that. Your, your area will start from prefs on down. Underneath prefs, we have personal information and also notification. If you want to go in and update some of your personal information, you'll click on that. This is where you can go and change your, your password. Uh, you can put your preferred name in there if you'd like. You can also update it with some of your contact information down here. Okay. Whenever you want to go back out to the main site, we've got two links to do that. We've got the Curricunet home link right here, or you can click on the banner up top that says Coastlines Curricunet. The next section you have is the build section. We have courses and also programs. We're going to be spending the majority of our time in courses today. This is for building new courses. This is for revising courses, also for building new programs and revising programs. Now, probably 90 to 95 percent of the time, you're going to be using this Curricunet system to revise existing material, okay, to revise courses. The rest of the time, you might be doing, you know, new, new builds, new creations. But for uh, everything else, again, it's going to be course revisions. Now, I'm going to show you how to go in and create a course from the very beginning, from scratch, just so that you can kind of understand the backstory of how it works. And then at the end, we'll go back and we'll touch on how to revise a course. And uh, you'll see that the process is very, very similar. It's almost identical. There are just a few things at the very beginning that are a little bit different. So um, that's the build section. 
Then we have the track section down here. So we had a couple people that were members of the curriculum committee. Uh, the, this area right here in the middle is going to be very applicable to, uh, to you. The My Proposals area, which is first up, is going to let you see everything that you have created curriculum-wise and what's in the system, what you have submitted to the approval process for people to begin you know, updating and critiquing. Uh, the My Approval section is where you go in to take action on things that you're responsible uh, for. So if you're a dean and you need to go and approve curriculum, you'll go into the My Approval section as a dean and you'll have a list of courses that are there that you need to go and approve. The All Proposals will show you everything that's in the curriculum system at any given time. So if you've submitted something, if a friend submitted something or somebody in your department and you want to see how that's coming along, you can actually go in and see everything that's going through the system. So it's very, very transparent as well. The next section down below there is, is links. This link section right here includes a lot of helpful information uh, that uh, Coastline Community College can go and put into the Curriculum site. So if you have uh, the Chancellor's Office that you're always going to or uh, some curriculum websites, we can, uh, or they have the ability to go and put those in there for your, for your benefit. We have our basic search uh, for courses and programs down below there. And uh, next down here we have Curricula Search. Uh, the Curricula Search module is actually really helpful, especially if you're developing new curriculum. Let's say that you're trying to branch out and, and develop some curriculum that you haven't ever dealt with before and you want to see how other schools are doing it. Well, for all those schools that participate in the Curricula system with the Curricula Search module, uh, we've actually uploaded their course outlines of records so you can actually go out and uh, grab examples of what other schools are doing to kind of help you along. Uh, then down at the bottom we have the help section that will have user guides and also training videos. And so look down there in the, in the future, we'll have some information uh, for you to kind of help you and assist you on your way with the Curriculum system. Okay, so that's the general navigation of the site. Let's go ahead and jump right in under the, uh, the course section. Let's go ahead and build ourselves a course. So again, uh, I'm on the main page right now. I'm going to go from Build down to Courses. I'll click on Courses and I'll get this screen right here. Now this is going to show me everything that I am working on right now. So all the courses that I'm creating or revising or whatever, they're going to be right here. Now, right now we're all logged in as Test User 4. So we don't have anything right now, but we will very shortly. We're going to have shoot almost 30 courses in there. So when we go and create our own courses we are just going to put in test information but keep track of which course number is yours because you might want to go back and look at that later on in another part of the process. Okay. So over on the left side under courses we have new course, modify, suspend, retire, and clone course. So there's several different things that we can do with our curriculum. Uh, at this point we're just going to focus on new course where we're creating it from scratch. And like I said before, we'll, we'll jump into the, uh, the Modify course later on. So at this point, go ahead and click on New Course. And this is going to bring us to our Create New Course screen. Now, if you've been involved with curriculum before, a lot of the screens and the pages and things that you're going to see are going to be very, very familiar. There shouldn't be a whole lot of new information here. Once again, what we've done is we have taken your process of what you're used to, all of your forms, uh, the paperwork and everything, we've consolidated it into the Curriculum system. And of course attached the approval process with it and made it really easy to track and see how everything is getting updated. So uh, I'm just going to kind of point out some of the, the basic functionality of the site. One thing you'll see right off the top is uh, some of these icons right here, these help icons. If you're coming through and you're filling out uh, the curriculum uh, pages and you're not quite sure what a certain area is referring to. Uh, you can go, Bonnie's been really, really good. She's got an insurmountable task of going through and actually populating all these help fields. Okay, so if you click on one of those, for instance, course number, you're going to get some information that's populated there to help you with uh, that particular field. So at this point, not everything's populated, but uh, it's a work in progress. Over here I've got uh, my division, my department, and my subject. These are just basic drop-down menus. You'll notice that in the subject area, the only area that you have right now for this test user 4 account is accounting. 
the Crickenet system is able to go and, and lock down people's profiles to only allow them to update and create curriculum in the areas that they're specifically designed to work in. So this keeps it so that somebody's not going out and creating curriculum all over the place. Okay, so if you, <clears throat> if you get into your site and you see that you need additional rights, that's a great time to go and contact your Curriculum uh, Administrator. So what we're going to do right now is we're just going to go and put in some test information here. Uh, so go ahead and let's go ahead and type some stuff in. Uh, I'm going to just pick things at random for my course number. Now the, uh, the system is going to go and do a check on the course number. So don't pick something the same as somebody else because the system won't uh, let you do that. All the course numbers have to be different. And not only that, I'm also going to put test course in my course title. Uh, just put test somewhere in the course title so that we know that this is in fact a bogus uh, uh, record. So that when we go through we can know which ones we can clean out pretty easily. Now down here in the catalog description you'll notice that we've got some basic uh, word processing functions. Now I heard that this is kind of the same case with Blackboard. When you go and copy and paste from Microsoft Word there's a lot of extra uh, garbage coding or junk coding. You're nodding your head. You know what this is going, right? Um, there's a lot of extra coding that comes with it. And as a result, it messes up the formatting on some of the reports and things. It might look okay when we put it in the screen right here, but behind the scenes, some things are kind of messed up. So what we've done is we've created a little button right here. It's a fifth from the left uh, on the scissors row. Uh, that allows us to strip out that coding. So if we're copying and pasting from Word, hit the scissors, or excuse me, the, uh, the, the copy from Word button, and it'll help strip that out. Uh, another thing that you can do is take your uh, typing from Word and copy it into a plain text source like Notepad, and then you can go from Notepad into Curriculum because that'll strip out all the extra stuff. Okay? Or you can just type it in right here. Uh, and if you do that, we have things like numbered lists, we have the indent and the outdent, so you can do um, more of an outline kind of format here. So again, we can change the, uh, the font styles and everything. So the main thing about the text areas, if you copy and paste from Word, make sure that you strip out the other uh, garbage coding that's in there with it. The last thing on this page right here is the proposal type. So if you remember this little diagram over here, that's the proposal type, that's the workflow. So for us right now, we want to go and put this into a certain workflow. And I've got a couple more since I'm logged in as an administrator. I'm going to select Golden West New Course. If I'm creating a new course, we're going to have a bunch of people looking at this. If I'm just doing a major, or excuse me, a minor modification, we might not, to have, we might not have to have so many people looking at it. If I'm doing uh, like a course deactivation, uh, my approval process or my workflow might be shorter still. So it does depend or uh, to, you need to make sure that you get the right proposal type in the box so it can go through the right workflow. Um, and what we've done is we've tried to limit the options down here so you won't inadvertently pick one that you're not supposed to pick or the wrong one. Don't worry if you do, there's a way to remove it and put it in the right workflow. You just have to contact your administrator for that. So in any case, I put in my catalog description, I've checked my proposal type, and now I'm going to go and click OK. So what this will do now is bring me to my course construction main menu. Over here on the left side, I've got my basic course information. It's got my name right here, uh, the title of my course, my subject area. And you'll also notice over here the WR. If I hover over that, I will get a list of reports that I can view. Now, at this time, there's not going to be anything in these because we're just starting to build this course. But we might go and take a look at this later on. We've got the course outline, the impact report. And so the impact report was the one that I showed you where if I make a change here, it's going to affect this over here. We also have the distance education addendum forms and the fee-based class proposal form. Okay, So we've, again, taken all of your process, all your forms. We've consolidated it into the Curriculum site. Here in the middle, I have an Attico contributor link. I'm going to click on that. This is really, really helpful here if I want to have somebody else help me in the creation of this curriculum. I'm going to select a name from the drop-down menu. We'll go and pick on Dorothy here. 
And so if I want Dorothy to help me work on this piece of curriculum, I'll sign her as a co-contributor. I can click on the cover page. I'll give her access to the course content, the assignments, and maybe the course fees page. Okay. So when Dorothy logs into her Build Courses screen, I don't know if you noticed it, but down at the bottom it had a uh, space for co-contributors or courses that you're a co-contributor on. This course will be listed on that part for Dorothy's Curriculum site. So she will have access to everything that I give her access to. So at this point, it looks like just four, uh, four individual pages. She'll have the ability to view everything else, but as far as actually having uh, the ability to edit is concerned, she only has access to the stuff I give her. So I can go and I can check everything, or I'm sure since Dorothy is really busy right now, I'll uncheck everything, hit cancel, and uh, we won't make her be a co-contributor for my course right now. Uh, I can add as many co-contributors as I would like, so that link will always be there. You can just continue to add them if you need it. Over here on the right side, we have the course checklist. Now this is where uh, everything should look familiar for the most part. Again, we've taken your forms, we've translated into this electronic uh, system over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of the items under the course checklist and fill out all of those pages. And once I've done that, then I can go and submit it for review into the approval process. So I'm going to start at the cover page. It doesn't really matter what uh, page you start in. You can go in any order, but sometimes it's nice to start at the top and go down. So on this page right here, you'll see that we've got all kinds of information. Some of this information, like the subject, the department, college division, uh, course title number, that was all brought over from that previous page. So I'm going to go through. We've got a couple of other things down here. I've got eligible FSA. So if I'm going to pick a, an eligible FSA, I can use the drop-down menu right here. And I can click on that particular area, and it's going to populate that FSA down there. Now if I need to make an additional selection, I can hit this drop down menu and I can pick another one and it will keep listing them down there as many as I need. Does anybody deal with cross listed courses? Yes? No? A little bit? Okay. Uh, we'll, uh, let's see here. We've got a place down here where we can actually designate this as a cross listed course or tie it to another course in the system. Again, this is going to be a simple drop down menu where I'm going to go and select um, a, 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 excuse me, a department area, <clears throat> and then I'm going to go, whoops, looks like I picked one that doesn't have any in there yet. So in any case, it'll give me the, the course, and so I can actually select the individual course that this is cross-listed with. Okay. Uh, moving on down the list, you'll see some more text editors here. Uh, way down at the bottom, here we go, we've got some more CB codes and top codes and all kinds of fun stuff, right? Uh, down at the bottom, I've got three buttons. I've got the cancel button, which just cancels my page and my, my th uh, information that I submitted during the session. I've also got a save button and a finish button. Now let's say that I'm working on this really, really hard and it's time to go to lunch and I want to save where I'm at and then come back later on. In that example, I'm going to go ahead and click the save button. The page is going to save as it is in its current form and you'll notice that I can come back and make changes and edits here. I've also got a timestamp up at the top. So it says that the page was last saved on this particular day at this time by this person. So that's me right there. So this is particularly helpful if you're working with a co-contributor. So if you've assigned Dorothy to help you out on the cover page, you can go in and uh, follow up and see if she's been working on this and when she was last in there. So let's say that I come back from lunch. I finish putting all the information on the page that I need to. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to click the finish button. The finish button does the same thing as the save button in the sense that it saves my entries. It's also going to put a date stamp up there. It's going to do two extra things though. The first of which is it's going to look for the completion of the form. There are certain pieces of information that have to be accomplished on this page. We call those business rules. Um, so the last thing we want to do is submit a course into the workflow and to have most of the information missing. So there are certain pieces of data that have to be in here before it can be finished. So the system is going to do a check on that. <clears throat> and if I'm missing something, I'm going to get a little teeny error up at the top of the page that says page not saved. So now I'm going to go down and say, OK, what did I miss? And right there in red, it's going to show me the area that I, that I overlooked. And so sure enough, 
page can't be saved without a valid, without a valid proposed start year. I'm going to go ahead and put in my proposed start year. I'm going to run the finish script again. And then the page finished for me. You'll notice the look and feel is a little bit different. I don't have my text boxes, my drop down menus. Uh, this is a view only screen. Okay? Um, I have a check mark in this box and the font colors turn to green. So the idea here is I've got a little checklist. I'm going to go through each of these uh, pages here under the course checklist. I'm going to finish every single one of them so that I can get a, a check mark here. Now for testing and training purposes what we've done is we have activated this submit button right here. But when you go to use this site, um, the live site, and we get the business rules reconfigured, that submit button will only be showing up when all of these areas have been satisfied. Okay? But for now, it makes it easy so we can just submit it and we don't have to go through every single page. Because I'm sure we'd really put some people to sleep at that point. Um, so in any case, that's the idea. I want to go and finish all these and then submit it into the workflow. Now let's say that I've made a mistake over here and I want to go and change it. What I need to do is go back over to that page and down at the bottom I actually have an unlock button. So I can go in and click unlock and what this will do is it will allow me to get right back into this page and make any changes or updates or edits that I need to. And then once I've done that I can click finish again and it will lock the page again. So I'm never truly locked out of my page here until I hit the submit button. When I hit that submit button and it gets put into the workflow, that approval process over there, uh, it's a done deal. I can't make any unauthorized changes. Now let's say that I get down here and the, the, the dean looks at my curriculum and says, I'm not quite sure I like your SLOs. Uh, I think we need to go and reorder those or add something to them. There are certain positions along the approval process line that actually has the ability to go and send it back to the originator for changes. Now, if this is the case, then they will temp the system will temporarily unlock the record so that you can go in and make those changes. Once you've made those changes, uh, you'll send it forward again and the system will lock your record again. So again, the only time that you're able to make changes is before you submit it. And then after you submit, the only time you can make changes is if you're authorized to by somebody in the approval process. Okay? Where was the unlock tab again? Down at the very bottom. So if I scroll down here, let me show you. <coughs> right down there. Right, thank you. Okay. All right. So at this point, I'm going to go through just a couple of the pages here to show you some of the functionality. And then we're going to go ahead and submit it. So uh, feel free to follow along. You can put your own information in there and, and check out some of the pages. Uh, the first one I'm going to click on is the units hours page. I want to show this one to you uh, be, uh, for a, a couple of different reasons. Does anybody work with variable units? Maybe? Yes? No? Okay. Well, if you do work with variable units, we've got this radio button up top. If you say yes, then you're going to notice that the page is going to change. It's going to open up a minimum and a maximum. So the nice thing about the curriculum system and the way that uh, Coastline Community College had this built was they wanted to make it so that the information that's pertinent to you is going to be what appears. If it's not, then it's going to stay hidden. So if it's not a variable unit class, we're going to say no, and those boxes disappear. Uh, if we have lab hours, we'll click on yes, and you'll notice that my lab hours box appears down there so I can put in my lab hour information. Now, down at the bottom, uh, I want you to take a look at this right here. This is a trigger area for the distance ed uh, section. You'll notice right here it's grayed out. I can't click on this. If I were to come and try to do this in the course checklist, it's unavailable to me. But this question right here asks me if this course can be offered as distance education in any form. And so if I say yes and save the page, you'll see that that distance education area right here unlocks itself. So now I can go in and I can go and fill out my distance education area. But again, if you're not doing distance education, just keep it as no and you don't have to worry about it. I'm sorry, where's the distance? Uh, if you go down to the bottom on the units hours page, it should be right down there. Okay. Let's see here. I want to also show you the course objectives page. 
Now right here under, under course objectives, we're going to start doing a little bit of a numbered list here. So these will actually translate over into our course outline. And you'll see that when I go and I input things right here, I have the ability to add them as a heading or as an objective. So early this morning we talked about uh, debits and credits. So I'm going to say uh, distinguish the difference uh, between debits and credits. Now if you're a horrible speller like I am, you can go and click on this little spell check icon right here. And this will actually check your spelling for you, which I really appreciate. If we had a misspelling, it would, it would highlight that in red. And we can click on it and it will give us suggestions. But it looks like we're good for now. I'm going to go ahead and click on Add as Objective. So down here, the Cricunet system has added this particular objective. And you can see that it's already numbered it for me. So there's no need to number this at all. So let's say that I actually want to go and add a heading. So I can, this could be under the heading of debits and credits. I'll add this as a heading. And of course, you'll be putting in real information here. You'll see that my debits and credits heading is in a bold font. And I've got a Roman numeral 1. I can use the move up and the move down arrows to reorder my objectives. So now I've used my move up arrow and my debits and credits heading is up top. I'm going to come over here to the course outline. So I went over to the left side of the page. I hovered over the WR icon. The very first one there is course outline. I'll click on that. And this will start to show me the information that I put into the system. So let me scroll down here. Here we go. I've got my debits and credits, and then my distinguish the difference between debits and credits. So again, this is kind of what I was saying before. I just barely made that change or that update in the course record, and I saved it, and it's immediately available on the reporting side. Okay, so all this is real time, so you're never ever going to get old information. <clears throat> Once I'm done with this, I'll go ahead and click finish. And again, the idea is to get a check mark in this box over here and work my way down until I get all of these finished. And once I do, then that magical submit button will show up. Let's see here. Let's go ahead and click on the course level student learning outcomes. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and show you how this text editor works right here. So with the uh, with the outcomes in this instance, we're actually going to be, let me scroll down here a little bit. Uh, you can see this add button right down here. Whenever you see an add button, that means that we're just doing things one at a time. The reason why we want to do things and enter things in one at a time is because of the reporting uh, capabilities of the system. If I was to go and paste all of my SLOs in here in one chunk, it doesn't allow me to break it out. And so that's why I want to just go one at a time. So at this point, let's see, we're in accounting. My, uh, my outcome text, who has, uh, who's got a good learning outcome for accounting? Keep it simple and something I could spell too. Anything? All right, how about this? Count to 10. Okay, that should be a pretty basic one, right? I'm going to go and enter, this is, this is my accounting course if I was teaching it, so you probably don't want me teaching accounting here. Uh, so I've got my course level student learning outcome count to 10. I'm going to enter in my assessment text. How am I going to assess that? I'll go and click Add. Now when I do that, I've got my, uh, my information right down here. And I've got the same basic, you know, move up, move down. Uh, scissors are for delete. And the pencils for edit. Uh, let's say that I'm, let's see here. OK. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this right here. Let me actually move over to the course content page. This is actually a better place to show you the, the outlining tool here. Um, let me go ahead and let's say I've got a uh, major topic right here. And I'm going to go and put this together in outline format. Now we have this outline tool user's guide that you can click on. And it's going to give you instructions on how this page works and how to use the, uh, the text editor here. I'm going to go ahead and highlight this. And then I'm going to come over here to my numbered list icon and click on that. And so now my major topic is now number one. 
If I hit enter, I'm going to get number two. So there we go. I'll say second major topic. Now, if I come back to my number one, I click on that and I hit enter, uh, I can go subtopic. I can highlight this. And this is where my indent and my outdent buttons come into play. If I click for this to be indented, you'll see that it scoots it over. And now this is a sub, uh, subtopic of my major topic. Okay? So that's a little bit about how this, uh, this rich text editor works right here. All right, let me go ahead and finish this page as well. Uh, let's see here. I think one of the other areas I wanted to show real quick is the requisites page. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> whenever uh, th this is a development site, sometimes we hit this every now and again. Um, whenever we get something like this, we get a nice little message sent off to our developers. Uh, but in any case, on the requisites page down here, this actually works uh, pretty simple. Uh, it's a pretty simple format. Uh, let's say that you have a course that needs to be a, a prerequisite or a co-requisite. You can actually click on that requisites page and then it'll give you a drop down that where you can go and select that actual course and then you can go and put any conditions with it. You can also specify a minimum grade. Say yeah, they have to take accounting 101 with a minimum grade of C minus. Uh, you can also add comments in there uh, if needed. So in any case, uh, that's the requisites area. Uh, a lot of these other areas, fairly self-explanatory again. There's not a whole lot of new information that you should be seeing in here because this should be all what you're, what you're used to. So at this point, we'll go ahead and move on. We're going to pretend that I've gone through and I finished uh, and hit the finish button for every single item underneath the course checklist. Now I'm ready to go and submit this into the workflow. So you can also do this too, we're on the dev side, it'll be fine. Go ahead and hit, and I remember what course number was yours too. Go ahead and hit the submit button. All right, so this screen is my build courses screen, and it says that I have no courses right now because I've submitted everything into the workflow that I had. So I'm gonna go back out to the main page by clicking up here on the banner. And I wanna see how my course is doing. So. I'm going to now transition into the tracking area so I can kind of follow it along as it moves through the approval process. So I'm going to go into track and then my proposals. This will show me, once again, everything that I have created and have submitted into the approval process. Now at this point, since we've got about a gazillion of us in here today, uh, you should have quite the list by now. So that's why I said go and find your, uh, find your course click on the course number there, the check status button to be brought into your area. So as an administrator, I have the ability to remove the proposal for faculty members. Uh, that's if a boo-boo was made, we just need to take it out real quick. For everybody else, you should just have the check status button. So I'm gonna click on check status. And this page right here is gonna let me see exactly what's going on with my course as it goes through the approval process. You can see up here I have a couple of reports that I could run. Over here I've got the originator, that's me. The action that was taken was submit. So I submit this in the workflow and it also tells me the date that this was accomplished on. Uh, I have a couple of extra action buttons right here since I'm logged in as an administrator that shouldn't be available for your view. But what you can see is that all the individuals that are in charge of approving the curriculum. So at this point, I've got the division curriculum representative and the department chair. So when I submit that, a script runs probably about 2 o'clock in the morning to go and send out an email uh, to those individuals to let them know that they have something to approve. So they'll get that email and they'll be able to log into the system, review your curriculum, make comments, and then pass it on. You'll see right here <clears throat> that we've got some numbers. We have 1, 2, 2.1, 2.5, 3. Uh, let me grab my marker real quick. These numbers tell us what, what's, uh, what level the proposal is in. So right here this is level one, right here we have level two, and then for sake of argument we'll say three and four. So that's what those numbers mean. Now you'll also see that we have required in parentheses. If you scroll down a bit further you might say something that says optional. Now, this is the way that we tell the system 
uh, who has the ability to move the proposal forward or backward and who doesn't. If somebody is marked as a required position, this means that when they go and review it and they take action, it's going to move it somewhere. Now if you're coded as optional, that doesn't mean that your job is optional or that you're not required to go and take action because you, uh, you're definitely needed in the curriculum process. It just means that you're there for, uh, to go in and review the curriculum and to make your comments. And once we have enough of the comments from the optional uh, positions, uh, well, let's take the example of the curriculum committee. Everybody on the curriculum committee would be coded as an optional step. You'll go in, you'll review the curriculum, you'll write your comments, but then the curriculum committee chair is the one that actually has the ability to push it forward or backward. Okay, so that's the difference there. So don't think that you're optional because you're not. You're very special. Uh, we do have this hold step in here. This is just for administrative purposes. That's nothing that you'll need to worry about. Now, this computer doesn't really like my visual report, uh, but everybody should be able to view it on your own workstation. If you click on the visual button right up top in the middle, this will actually give you this diagram that I was talking about right here, a visual representation of where your course is within the approval process. So the very first one should be colored in. It should be purple. Uh, if you look over on the left side, there's a little globe. As people go through and take more actions and complete more things, you're going to see that filling up with different colors that represent the actions which they took. So in any case, that visual uh, representation gives you a really good idea as to where it's at a real quick glance. Because sometimes, I don't know, I'm kind of like this. I'm a little bit more of a visual learner myself. So this is so that I can see every, pro excuse me, every proposal that I have put into the process. Again, this is tracking my proposals. I'm going to go ahead and come back out to the Curriculum at Home site. Now let's say that you are that uh, division curriculum representative or the dean or a member of the curriculum committee. You get that special email that says that you need to go in and update the curriculum. What you're going to do and you won't have anything in your test accounts at this point, so you can just follow along if you'd like. You're going to go into the tracking area to My Approvals. When you click on My Approvals, you're going to be presented with this drop-down menu that's going to have all of your applicable roles that you have here at the college. So I'm going to go down, I'm going to find the Division Curriculum Representative, and I'm going to click Next. And now, this should give me a list of all of the courses that I have to approve based off of my role. So I'm going to have a whole fun bunch of them here. Uh, but again, I've got uh, several icons to help me become familiar with the curriculum. If I click on this pencil icon right here, this is going to bring me into those course screens. But instead of actually being able to go in and make changes or edits, uh, that unlock button is going to be replaced with something uh, with a button that says done. Okay, Because again, we're not going to let anybody make any unauthorized changes to the courses. Um, I have my, my uh, course outline, which we've looked at already, the course impact, which is that report that we looked at that says if I make a change right here, it's going to impact these other areas over here. Uh, the VS right here is the visual, so again, if we wanted to see uh, where it's at in the process, we'll click on that. Uh, the C with the exclamation mark is the comments section, so that page that we clicked on uh, where it showed us uh, our course and all of the, the list of everybody that was supposed to take action. It'll show us their comments as well. Uh, we also have a special SLO report for you over here, which is going to go and take the SLOs and bring them out in their own specialized report. Now, the one report that I showed you at the very beginning that showed the changes, that is the, uh, the course comparison report right here. It's listed in the legend, but since this is a new course, there's nothing to compare it to. Now, if we were doing a course modification, that course comparison report would show up over here. That would be an option if we clicked on that. Then that page would show us all the blue and the green, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the red and the green areas with the old and the new information. So that's where you'd see that report there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here. I'm going to view the reports, view the course itself. I need to get familiar with this piece of curriculum. Once I've become acquainted with it, I know what it's all about. I've formulated my opinion. I know the areas that need to be fixed, or maybe it's fine. I'm going to come down here and click on the Action button. When I click on the Action button, this, uh, this other approval process screen is going to show up where I can go and type in my comments. 
So I can come over here and say, nice, oops, nice course, or whatever I might put in there. Uh, check out SLO number four. It looks like we need to work on the, uh, the verbiage there a little bit, or whatever it is. Now, once I put in my comments there, I'm going to come down to the action area. Let me click this drop down. Now, based off of my role as division curriculum representative, uh, these are the different actions that I have. So, when you log in as a curriculum committee member or a dean or librarian, your action list might be something that's a little bit different, but this is an area that we can go and uh, use this help button right here to kind of define what's going to go on. So, at this point, I can send it back to the originator for corrections, and again, this will temporarily unlock the record so they can come in and make those changes. Or I can just send it forward with you know, nothing that needs to be changed, uh, forward with concerns, or mark it as reviewed. Okay? So we have a couple of different options there. At this point, uh, since it is a nice course, I'm going to say forward, and I'll go ahead and click save. So what this will do is it will remove it from my queue as division curriculum representative, and then pass it on to the next level down here. So in this case, in our fictitious workflow, we've got the librarian next. Okay, so they're going to go take a look at this. And so again, that email is going to go out, the librarian is going to get that the next day, and they're going to go in, do the same thing I did, review it, make their comments, take their action, and it'll go and pass it on to the next person. Okay? All right, let me come back out to the home screen here. Uh, let me go and take a look at my, or excuse me, all proposals. So this again is showing me everything that's going through the curriculum system at this given time. So let me go and check on uh, the status of this one right here. There we go. So in this case, we're looking at this other course over here. And you'll see right here, this is the comment section. Here are my comments and then whatever those comments are. So again, if I want to go and take a look at anything that's going on in the system, this is where I come. I can view everybody's comments. So again, this is tied to your name up here. So make sure you're nice because everybody can see it. Okay. Sorry, where is that? This is under the All Proposals area. Okay. So if I go out to the main, uh, the main site right here, I'm under Track, All Proposals. And again, this will show me everything in the curriculum system. I'm clicking on Check Status. And then I get the status of this particular proposal. Okay. So again, I can check somebody else is in the departments or somebody else, you know, across the hall or whatever. <clears throat> uh, when you finish the course, or excuse me, when the course uh, finishes going through the whole entire approval process and it ends up at the very end and it's approved, and everybody likes it, and now we're going to use it next semester. We can go and check the old records by clicking on completed proposals down here. And this will give us another list of all the courses or programs that have gone through this approval process. So if we need to go back and see uh, some of the comments or whatever, uh, they'll all be uh, kept in the completed proposals there. So we're always going to keep that historical record of the curriculum. <clears throat> all right. So that covers building a new course and that also covers tracking our proposals as it moves through the approval process. Now, like I said at the very beginning, probably 90-95% of the time you're going to go through and uh, probably be revising curriculum. And like I showed you before, we've loaded all of your curriculum in the database. It's all sitting there all nice and pretty. So let's fast forward three years from now. I created my course. We've used it. Now it's time to go do some updates. What I'm going to do is come back over to the Build section and click on Courses. Now, instead of using the new course, I'm going to click on Modify Course. So for this next part, uh, you don't have to follow along because we're actually going to, I'm going to make a modification of an existing course, so I'll just do it up here. Uh, but in any case, it's going to lock me down to my college and my subject because I'm not going to go in and go and modify some other school's material, right? So I'm going to go and satisfy the filter criteria here. I can just keep it. The subject line is accounting and the, the course number open. It's going to pull everything or I can do a search 
if I know specifically what I'm looking for. At this point, I'm going to leave it open. I'll hit OK. And this will give me a list of all of the courses that I have the ability to go and make a copy of and modify. So here we've got some of those familiar icons. Again, I've got my course outline. I can actually go into the course itself and take a look at it. It won't let me change anything, but I'll be able to see each of the screens. I've got my SLO report, but I also have this icon right here that allows me to make a copy of this. And so what's basically happening here is I have my original version, we'll call it version 1, of my course, and it's active. We're using it right now. It's in this list right here. But three years has passed, and I need to go and make an update to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and click on this copy icon right here, and I'm going to select the proposal type that I'm going to use. So since I'm an administrator, I have all of them listed. But let's say that I'm just doing a, a modified course proposal. So I'm selecting this particular proposal type. This is the, the group of people, the structure that's going to follow to get approved. Uh, once I click OK, the system is going to take that accounting C100 and it's going to make a, a direct copy of it. So here we go. I've hit my copy icon. There we go. And all of a sudden, I'm in version 2. All right. So, but instead of being active, this is now, uh, my marker is giving out on me. This is pending. Okay. Um, it's not the active one because we want to save the integrity of this because if this one flops, at least we still have this one. So I never, ever, ever want to make any changes to my, work, or to my active copy. I always want to make a working copy of it. So I can go through. You'll notice that none of the items under the course checklist are marked off. However, the information is still there. So if I come over here to the cover page, I can scroll down here, and there's all the information. Okay? So what I can do is I can go through here and verify all the information is correct. And uh, for down here, we've got the proposed start year of 2010. Maybe I'm doing an update, so my proposed start year is 2013. I'll go and make all the necessary corrections. I'll click Finish right here. And now uh, it's kind of business as usual. I'm going to go through the rest of the information under the course checklist, verifying the information, making the updates as needed, but finishing each page because I have to take, uh, I have to be accountable for each of those pages uh, that show up. So once I'm done with this, my magical submit button will show up there on the left side, and so I've got my pending course. And now, now I need a different. Oh, thanks. I got a backup over here. You're very kind. Maybe I'll use that one. It uh, looks newer. Thank you. Sure. You can tell she's a teacher. <laughs> All right. So, well, that is so much better. What are you doing next hour? Because I might need to. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Thanks. All right. So, in any case, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit that submit button. And then my, my pending version is going to go through the approval process right here. And once it finishes its course, and everybody is happy, they like it. This is now going to be made um, the official version. And so now instead of being pending, it's going to be active. Sorry about that. And then now my version 1, since this was tied to it, this is no longer going to be active. This is going to be made historical. Okay. So whenever we do a, a modification, uh, again, we want to save the integrity of our original active one, but when this one becomes active, this one's made historical. And so if I go back the next three years later, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to make a copy of this active course right here. I'm going to now have version 3, and then once version 3 is approved, then it will become the active version, and this will be made historical. Okay? So that's how the course modification works. So like I said, it's very, very similar to creating a new course. The only difference is uh, the way that you start. So again, uh, going under the Build section, we're going to click on Courses, Modify a Course. We'll satisfy the filter criteria. We'll find the course that we need to copy. Click on the Copy icon, select our proposal type, and then hit OK. And then we'll be back into that checklist again. 
Okay, once again, business as usual. The nice thing about the way that the system works right here is somebody cannot go into an active version and make an unauthorized change. You have to go through that process that I just showed you in order to change the curriculum. Now, they can go in and do that. It's not, again, going to mess, the, uh, mess up the active version because we're going to save that. They're only going to go in and create a new version in the pending form. In order for it to become activated, it has to go through that workflow and be approved by the school. Okay? So that is the, uh, the course modification area. Let's see here. Oh, you know what? Let me go back over. There's one thing I wanted to show you real quick. Oops. Not automotive. All right. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Now, this is the, uh, this is the course that I just copied over, the, the modified pending version. The thing that I want to point out to you right over here is the list of changes. This is a new element that comes up on a modified or revised course that does not show up when you're building a course uh, brand new. Because in a modification, we're actually changing what's already there. So now my list of changes gives me a list of areas that I'm, uh, that I'm changing. So I've got substantive changes up here, and I've got non-substantive changes down here. So again, at a quick glance, somebody can come in here and say, OK, what are the things that I need to look for? Are they big changes? Are they little changes? This will tell me right quick. And again, I also have that uh, the course, um, that, that comparison report, the course changes report, that at a quick glance, the, uh, the red and the green lets me see the changes in that format as well. Okay? All right. Let's see here. The last area really is the, uh, the program section. Uh, does anybody update and do a whole lot of programs in here? Yes, no? Okay. Probably courses is going to be the main thing that you're dealing with. Uh, the program is going to work the exact same way uh, as the courses area. So I'm going to come over here to programs, create new programs, and I'm going to just have the same subject areas here uh, that, that I'm tied to. Uh, we got award type, proposal type, those types of things. So. Uh, the questions are going to be a little bit different because we're dealing with programs instead of courses, or the process is all the same. So let me go in here and just type in some oops, test program, my award type, and my, um, my proposal type here. I'll click Save. All right. So you can see over here on the degree certificate checklist, uh, my checklist is significantly shorter than what it is over in courses, okay, which is kind of nice. Uh, all the, the meat and potatoes, well, that's actually in the courses, so that's the hard work, and we just need to kind of group and categorize it over here. So again, we have the co-contributor area over here, basic things here. The one area I want to show you over on the program side, though, is the course blocks definitions page. Now, this is the page that allows us to group our courses into like terms. So uh, perhaps you might have freshman year, first semester, uh, sophomore year, second semester. You have to take these courses. Okay, this is the tool that does this. Now, I'll tell you this there are a few things that, um, uh, for instance, formatting issues. We've got the course block definition page here, or field here, then the header and the footer. Uh, there are certain things that might be specific as far as formatting is concerned that uh, your college will have you come out with. Um, they might want you to use the header field, they might not. I have a user guide that walks you through how to create this, so if you don't get it right now, that's fine. Uh, but for my course block definition, let me go, this is going to be the title, the main title for the courses that I'm going to list. So I'm going to say um, uh, something like first semester. Uh, I can have a header, and I wish I had a, a an example to show you how this works. Uh, but basic, well, maybe I can draw it up here real quick. All right. So I'll have my header. Let's say that this is my form. My header will be right here. 
uh, and then in a larger font, we'll have my course block. Oops, I told you I can't spell. There's my uh, my course block definition right there, and then I'll have my footer. Okay, now underneath my course block, this is. Let me scooch my footer down just a little bit here. Underneath my course block, once I've defined this, then I can go and start to add my different courses. So maybe I'll have accounting uh, 101, and I'll have three credit hours over here, then accounting 102 uh, with three credit hours over here, and then I'll have my, uh, my total credit hour count uh, down here at the bottom. So I can have several course blocks. Um, with several course blocks, uh, with another, um, uh, with, with additional courses listed. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm horrible at drawing. I can't draw to save my life. But uh, hopefully, when we get some courses in here, we'll kind of see how it uh, how it works out. So in any case, we're going to just put first semester for my course block definition. I will put header in this field, and again, footer in this field, just so that you can see where it's going to show up for formatting purposes. And again, depending on how your school wants you to use this form, you may or may not be using some of these fields. So uh, I've got my first semester. Uh, down here, I've got two radio buttons. I've got the default button, where all units are calculated. What this means, if, it's, if this box is checked, and I'm totaling up all my credit hours right here for my course block, uh, if Accounting 101 is worth three credit hours, it's going to bring it over as three credit hours. Uh, so we're going to use this button to uh, calculate everything as it appears in the Curriculum system. But let's say, um, let me go ahead and add this in right now. But let's say that's not always the case. Sometimes we have uh, groups of elective courses that we can have students pick from. So I'll say electives. Pick 12 of the, oops, pick 12 of the following, okay? Now, I'm going to list a bunch of courses down there, and I don't necessarily want to go and bring every single credit hour unit from the Cricket system because I'm going to have more than 12 credit hours. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to override the, uh, the credit hours in the Cricket system by selecting the units, specify unit range. So right here, I can go a range. I can say 6 to 9 credit hours. I can say 10 to 15, whatever it is. At this point, I just want to bring over 12 credit hours. So I'll put 12 in uh, both of those boxes and click Add. So I'm going to go through, and I'm going to define each of my blocks. So I might have first semester, second semester, uh, however I have them grouped together. And I'm also going to define how much each block is worth. So this one it's going to be worth as many courses as I list. This one right here, since I defined it myself, it's only going to be worth 12 credit hours regardless of how many courses I put in there. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and uh, since I have them defined, I'm going to click on courses and now I'm going to assign the courses to that specific block. So during my first semester, now I've got to go find my course, I'm going to go click on my subject area Subject area is accounting, and now I'm going to go and find my, um, my course. And so I have introduction to accounting. The three means it's worth three credit hours. Now, sometimes I might not pick a course at all. Uh, maybe I'm just going to put in some non-course requirements, maybe a portfolio or a certain certification that a student has to have. Or I can use this for other formatting or text reasons. I can put that information in here. At this point, I'm just going to leave it blank. I also have a conditions box. So if I say you need to take accounting C100 and another course, this conditions box allows me to select and. There's also an or statement, so I can say and this or or this. Uh, I also have this unit range. If for some reason you need to overwrite this number as it appears in Curriculum, you have the ability to do that. Uh, technically, well, the only reason why you would do that is let's say that this course right here was undergoing review and I knew that the credit hour uh, unit number was going to change from three to four, I can preemptively change that right here. Or perhaps in the certification area when I've not selected a course, I can make the certification worth a certain amount of credits right down here as well. 
Uh, I also have an exception identifier. This is just a fancy term for a footnote. So let's say for this accounting C100 course, I can put in a, an asterisk. And I can say a course must be uh, taken oops, uh, during uh, the fall semester. OK. So now I'm going to go ahead and click Add. And this is going to add that course uh, down below. I can come down here and pick another um, accounting class. And I can continue to add courses uh, to this particular block. And so as I do this, we'll see them listed down here. Once I've finished adding all the courses in this area, I'm going to click Done. And now I've got my first semester uh, courses listed. Now I'm going to move on to my electives. I'll click on Courses. It'll be the exact same thing. I'm just going to go and select multiple courses and put them in there. Again, the only difference is it doesn't matter how many courses I pick, because as far as our total is concerned, this, is, this area is only going to be worth 12 credit hours. Down here at the bottom, I've got a running total. So 12 of these uh, credit hours comes from this block right here, and the other uh, 10 to 12 come from uh, this up here. So I have a variable, couple variable units in there. That's why I have a range down here. So this is the moment we've all been waiting for. Let me come up here to the, uh, the outline page. Let's see if this will display for me. There we go. So this is the, this is the course blocks area. So underneath the program title, sometimes I might have the program definition and maybe some other information there. Here's where my header would have appeared if I needed to put a header there. Here's my course block. It says first semester. I've got my course number, the title, my units over there. And then I've got my electives. And if I had listed any of those, they'd be listed down here. And I've got my subtotal down there. And then of course, the total units down at the bottom. So again, this is how we're going to group those courses together on the program side of things. So as far as the programs go, like I said, the process is very similar to the way that you're going to put courses together. Uh, not as much information. The only page that's really different is the Course Blocks Builder page. And again, some of the formatting issues are going to be dictated by your college. But we ha will have a guide that will help you through that process because it can kind of get tricky a little bit and sometimes you can kind of forget what goes here and what we do over there. Uh, so in any case, uh, let's see here. When I'm done with that, I'll click Finish. So again, concept just the same as courses. I'm going to finish each of these items here. When I get a check mark in each of the boxes, I'm going to have my Submit button show up over here. I'll click Submit, and it'll get dumped into the approval process. Those emails will start going out. People will log in, review the process, take action, move it on to the next person. Okay. So that is the program side of Cricunet. And at this point, uh, that should actually bring uh, the presentation portion to a conclusion. I was dealing with building and creating courses, programs, also tracking the proposals. Uh, so at this point, uh, since we're done with that portion, I'd like to go ahead and open up for a few minutes for questions.